Welcome back to most of you. How many first timers here, if you can raise your hand? We've been doing this for 14 years, and this is your first time you figured this out. <laughs> Welcome, one and all. Uh, this is the first time that we actually have a triple sellout. Uh, you're apparently the lucky ones to get the main venue. There's spillover into our next largest room, and then spillover into the next one. And not only that, we are live streaming on the internet. So a lot of people will participate in this 14th annual Isaac Asimov Memorial Debate. I want to publicly thank Janet Asimov, Isaac Asimov's widow. Those of you who might not know, Isaac Asimov did, he wrote more than 300 books, and much of the research that went into his nonfiction books, and perhaps some of his fiction books, was conducted in the research libraries of this institution. And so there is a connection that we have with him that few other institutions had. And his family uh, decided that we would conduct this annually in his honor. Uh, Isaac Asimov, perhaps the last polymath uh, of our civilization. So I want to uh, publicly thank and acknowledge Janet Asimov on that. Uh, tonight's subject, as you have surely gleaned by now, is nothing. <laughs> and uh, the existence of nothing. And the program, just so you know, uh, we weren't running out of toner, all right? <laughs> we were trying to figure out a way to have the title become nothing. So this is our attempt to capture that fact. There's nothing wrong with your program. Uh, since we last met, uh, an asteroid struck Russia, <laughs> the Curiosity rover plunked down on Mars, the Higgs boson was discovered, the universe has been a busy place. Uh, a lot does happen in a year, and it's just great to have all of you back uh, each year. The subject of nothing. Uh, I don't know if George Gershwin wrote the first song ever, on the subject of nothing, but in Porgy and Bess, the title of the song was, I've got plenty of nothing, and nothing's got plenty of me. And so nothing, of course, has been on people's minds a long time. Actually, back then, the words of that song would have been uttered, I got plenty o' oh, nothing. That's how they were written. Times have changed, haven't they? Uh, we, uh, my parents are here this evening. They're 85 and 84 years old. I just want to publicly recognize them. They brought me here as a child at age nine, my first visit to the Hayden Planetarium here as a native of the city. And today, I am the Frederick P. Rose director of the same place that launched me on this epic voyage of discovery. So those are institutions operating at their best. Uh, they brought a friend with them, Heidi Sweets is her name, and uh, they forwarded me a poem she wrote on nothing. I felt compelled to read this before we begin uh, to set some of the mood of the evening. Nothing speaks volumes. In prison dreams, jailed forever, forgiveness weeps. No tears are released. Silence begs for ease. Anger has no hope. Indifference rejoices, while nothing holds court with gestures of time. Nothing waits and waits. Thank you, Heidi, for that contribution. Written before... She even knew of this panel. Let's bring out our guest and get the party started. My first guest. My first guest is a professor of physics at Stanford University, professor of theoretical physics, that is. Don't know if she's ever even visited a particle accelerator, but she tells him perhaps what to look for. Professor Eva Silverstein. Eva. Next, we have our first time ever three-peat, 
three-peat. We have the physicist and professor of Earth and space exploration, Lawrence Krauss. Lawrence, come on out. <laughs> Lawrence was in the first ever Asimov debate. The fact that he's been here three times means he just always works on controversial topics. Hence, we always reach for him. Uh, my next guest, a longtime colleague of mine during my days at Princeton, is J. Richard Gott III. He's professor of astrophysics there. Rich Gott, come on out. Rich, you brought a shopping bag. I don't know what you got going there. Well, maybe we'll find out later. I'm almost afraid to ask. Reminding you that this is a debate about nothing. So, uh, next, we have a longtime writer, contributor to major publications, and his specialty on the topics on which he writes is the intersection between physics and philosophy, Jim Holt. Jim Holt, come on out. Thank you, thank you. Um, and last, and I was going to say not least, but it kind of is least because this guy is the world's expert on zero. Charles Seif, come on out. He's professor of journalism, New York University. So the way this works is you are eavesdropping on a conversation the five of them will be having that I will be steering. All right, these aren't lectures. These are not, it's kind of just, see what we would talk about if we were at a bar. That's really how this works. We've done this 14 years in a row, and we have a fun time doing it, and I'm glad you're here to join us. So uh, each of the five panels will start out with like one or two minute uh, remarks, just so you can hear their voice and get a feeling for uh, how they speak, and then we'll jump right in. So Eva, please, let's begin with you. So let me just say that one of the greatest results in all of physics, I think, is our understanding of how structure in the universe formed, starting from quantum fields that for all practical purposes were in their ground state, in their vacuum state. And that, combined with the inflationary expansion of the early universe and quantum mechanics, leads to the origin of structure that we see today. And just last point about this for now is that one of the most interesting features that we've learned about this more recently is it sensitivity to, to very high energy physics um, questions that bring in problems of quantum gravity, um, and uh, which on the one hand, and which on the other hand are accessible through some observations of the microwave background radiation. So to me, that's, to me, that's the most interesting uh, version of nothing that, that I know. So, <laughs> so you're saying, when you say it's sensitive too, you mean possibly experiments can come and, and have a bearing on your theoretical meanderings. Indeed, so the, the inflationary theory is, is uh, subject to probes. In fact, there's one coming out tomorrow that's very relevant. Tomorrow, so we're one day too early. But we get to, did get to hold today on the vernal equinox, right? Just so you know. <laughs> uh, happy spring to everyone. And those of you on the internet, if you are the 15% of the world's population who lives south of the equator, happy autumn, okay? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and that would include 100% of the world's penguins. Happy autumn to <laughs> penguins. Free penguins, that would be. Uh, Lawrence, uh, reintroduce yourself to everybody here. Thanks for coming. Just off the plane from Sweden, by the way. Lawrence, thanks for coming in a third it's a, time. It's always a pleasure to be back and, and, um, and, and to have fun here. Uh, well, obviously, I've thought a lot about nothing. I've written a book about it recently. But I think that the, the most exciting thing, there are two things. First of all, that we've learned that most of the universe is nothing. Nothing is the most important part of the universe. So you're all more insignificant than you thought. <laughs> and the second thing is that if you asked, and one of the things I find most amazing, is if you asked what would be the characteristics of a universe that was created from nothing by just natural laws without any supernatural shenanigans, it would be the characteristics of the universe we live in. And that I find amazing and worth, and worth uh, uh, celebrating, because uh, it makes God more redundant than God was before. Uh, but, um, and the other thing I guess I want to say before I leave, is, before I end, is I, I, I think you know, Jim, who, who's, who I greatly admire, I expect will, will disagree with some of the things I want to say. So I want to say right off at the beginning um, 
But for those people who are old enough and understand the spirit of what I'm about to say is... Wait, Jimmy you want to start a fight different. already. We just, well, we just, just on, opening on, just remarks. Let me, Neil, let me finish what I'm going to okay. say before you interrupt. You'll interrupt later. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say, Jim, you're an ignorant slut. Okay. <laughs> for those born... Before 1960, <laughs> that's an expression on Saturday Night Live exactly. uttered in 1975. Yes. Next, Rich Gott. Uh, that's how it's going to go. <laughs> uh, um, I'm Rich Gott. I work on general relativity and cosmology. And I discovered an exact solution to Einstein's field equations for a cosmic string and for then two moving cosmic strings. And that was interesting. Uh, because it allowed time travel to the past, like several solutions that are known. Kurt Gödel found one in 1949, and then there's the wormhole solution. I I'm, I'm wearing a coat tonight that uh, Bob Kirshner called the coat of the future. He said, Richard, you must have gotten this coat in the future and brought it back in your time machine because this color hasn't been invented yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I'm talking about time travel, which I will a little bit tonight, I'm... I'll, I wear this uh, coat. So um, <laughs> I'm uh, relevant to tonight. Uh, Li Jingli and I worked on a quantum vacuum state uh, that we thought might be relevant for the creation of the universe. We'll say more about that. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jim Holt, what, do, what have you got for us? Uh, well, uh, in the light of uh, Lawrence's, uh, or may I call you Larry, your, your ungallant. Uh, Illusion to me. <laughs> I, I, I am not ignorant. Um, I'm going to spend most of my breath uh, <laughs> attacking you, and I'm going to attack you from the left. Uh, for, uh, you are an avowed uh, militant, tub-thumping atheist, and uh, you, uh, you, you know, the, the old equation that we have uh, that we inherited from uh, Christian metaphysics is that God created the world. Uh, out of nothing, so it's God plus nothing equals the world. And you take God out of the equation, and I'm all for that, but you, so now we have blank plus nothing equals the world. And what you put in the blank is the laws of nature, the laws of quantum field theory. And I think that actually in worrying too much about the problem of why there's something rather than nothing, and trying to find something to put in the blank where God used to be, you're actually still in thrall to, the, uh, to Christian metaphysics. And I think you, you see uh, the, the laws of nature, particularly the laws of quantum field theory, very much as divine commands. So I think you're, you're, you're uh, shall we say, um, uh, insufficiently enlightened. Uh, <laughs> oh, snap! How dare snap. you be so rude? <laughs> right. Why, no one's ever said that. We'll revisit this. Uh, so, Charles, Mr. Zero. <laughs> uh, Wait, we get his mic microphone working over there? Hello, testing. Yep. They turned it to zero. I think. <laughs> <laughs> you are so full of zero. Why don't you borrow this? Uh, I'm Charles Seif, and I think I'm just here to fulfill my father's prophecy that I'm good for nothing. <laughs> I was a, uh, born to be a mathematician and didn't wind up that way uh, after studying mathematics for a while. Um, I wound up uh, in the Economist Building in London uh, and realizing that, hey, journalism is a lot more fun uh, than s uh, sitting in your office doing the silly of not invariance. So uh, I joined the circus, joined, uh, became a journalist, but of course uh, my mathematics core was still there. And my first book was about math that I loved, and perhaps the most fascinating thing uh, I encountered during my studies was zero. Cool. So I'd like to start with you. Test, test your mic one more time. Is Testing it? one, two, three. Yeah, he works now. Good. Thank you. So I just want to start out with you. Zero, uh, it seems to me that was, was that people's first attempt to quantify nothing, to turn nothing into something? Because, of course, in case you never noticed, Roman numerals cannot represent zero. Have you ever thought about that? There is no zero in Roman numerals. So ancient Rome and their huge and great civilizations precedes the invention of zero. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. That's right. So, so oh. what, what took so long? 
uh, well, we, we humans had a real revulsion for nothing, for void, for... Emptiness. Don't we still? Was it then and not now? Oh, it's, it's still here. It's still here, uh, although it's, it's diminished somewhat. Um, I think it's because, in part, uh, we humans uh, have... I think that's what you say, we humans. We humans. <laughs> am, okay. am I including people that I shouldn't? <laughs> no, I just, that's <laughs> Okay. No, uh, we're good. We humans, go. Uh, I, I, I just like the phrase. That, that for us, uh, nothingness represents something that uh, we're afraid of, that uh, disorder a breaking of the rules, that one of the things that we humans do is we control our environment. And the way we control our environment is through imposing order on things, by figuring out the way things work. And zero represents, in some ways, uh, nothingness represents a return to the lawlessness, the primordial ooze without rules. Um, for example, if you look in the Bible, uh, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the creation myth, Start. It's the Old Testament to Christians, okay? Just so mm -hmm. you get the go. <laughs> the, the, uh, the creation was out of nothing. If you read the, the Hebrew, it says uh, the, the world, the earth, was formless, chaotic, and void. And it's not a coincidence that chaos and void were twinned because the void represented a lawlessness, a breaking of the rules, that how could something which was nothing have any rules that defines what it is, how it works, how it behaves. And by breaking the rules, it became scary. But the primordial chaos was not nothing. It was a disordered something. I mean, the, the, the uh, Hebrews... i got to go with Jim on this. The ancient yeah. Greeks didn't really have a, a, a concept of, of absolute nothingness. They, they thought of... The, you know, the, the things began in chaos, and order was imposed in chaos, and chaos became cosmos. But it wasn't, it was only with Christianity, I think, that the idea of creation ex nihilo uh, uh, came to Out of be nothing. formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, because you know, the idea was that God was so powerful, was so all powerful, he didn't need any pre existing material to create the world. In, f in, uh, fact, the in fact, it actually comes from way before the Greeks, the Rig Veda. All of it didn't have creation from nothing, it was creation from some primordial stuff, yeah. uh, often water in, in a lot of the creation myths, but, but uh, primordial stuff, yeah. as opposed to the real nothing, which is yeah. what I'm going to talk about. By the way, the Hebrew <laughs> term for that in the Bible is, is wonderful. It's tohu bohu, which... Uh, yeah, and, and actually the tohu is the chaos, the, form, the okay. chaos, so what's the bohu? bohu is actually a very difficult word in Hebrew because there's, it was used, I believe, three times in the Bible, and it is believed to mean void. Okay. In the true sense. I mean, it may okay. not have okay. been exactly yeah. Well, that's why, because we... today when anyone uses the word chaos, we're not referring to a place where nothing is happening. We're referring to a place where everything is going on, but just in a disordered state. So the modern use of the word chaos is not consistent with nothing, I would say. But that's, you know, but that's the whole point, I think, is that the ideas of nothing have changed since these vague ill-defined notions, and, and that's good. It's not a bad thing. That it's called learning. Well, however, so, but in the, in the, in the, the Hebrew Bible, uh, we presume, regardless of whether there was a void, are we saying the void and the chaos preceded the formation of the universe, or is that just the early universe as described in the book? Well, it's, it's actually ambiguous, because if you looked at, say, the Septuagint, uh, one, one of the versions of the Bible, that, in fact, there's an implication that there was a previous creation and that there was a creation out of n nothing, the, the chaos of the previous creation. But in the, uh, the Bible that we use, the Pentateuch, um, it is the, the use of the past implies that this is the first creation out of nothing. So, so Jim, when did, when did philosophers start weighing in on this? Uh, really with, uh, with Leibniz in the uh, 17th century, he was the first uh, thinker to pose the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And by nothing, he meant uh, a state in which there are no existence at all. There, there, uh, there are no entities, there's no chaos, there's no space, no time, absolute nothingness. And it's very difficult to, uh, to grasp in the imagination. If you try to uh, obliterate all of the contents of your consciousness or try to imagine all of the... Uh, the contents of the universe slowly being extinguished, the, the stars going out, the atoms disappearing, life disappearing, time and space disappearing. Uh, it's interesting, the son of uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Hardly Coleridge, as a child, 
uh, had precisely this, this uh, intellectual struggle, and he said, and I imagined, you know, all of this disappearing, all the grass and the stars and the people, and there was nothing but dark and cold, and, and nothing to be dark and cold. So that, you know, that's the best you can do, and uh, even when you try to reach nothingness in your imagination, there's still, you know, the little light of your consciousness, you know, creeping under the door. Um, I, actually, my, the only times I've succeeded in uh, imagining absolute nothingness is uh, two times. Once but during, you, you've uh, succeeded? Yes, this. once during... Uh, under during, what actually, influence? Actually, every night during dreamless sleep, <laughs> and once while I was watching professional bowling on television. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Not a bowler, I would guess, <laughs> here. Okay. Um, so, uh, Leibniz, by the, just, I, I give you, uh, li Leibniz. excuse me, Leibniz, I, I'll give you space to hypothesize here. Would you say that his thoughts of nothing uh, contributed to his invention of the calculus? Uh, or, or put him in a place where, because Leibniz, as well as Newton, sort of co-separate inventors of calculus, uh, almost contemporaneous. So, would, do you think one of those had to do with the other? Yeah, well, the, the crucial notion of the calculus is the notion of the infinitesimal, the infinitely small. And the, what is the infinitesimal? It's not nothing, but it's not quite something either. It somehow mediates between finitude and nothingness. So, yeah, I mean, I think you have to have a, a sort of a temperamental attraction to dangerous ideas. I mean, the infinitesimal was considered to be a, an extremely dangerous idea, and uh, there was a great resistance to the calculus, uh, because of it, and I, I think that... No, uh, why is it dangerous? You keep putting these terms It's dangerous in it. because it, it, it sometimes it acts like a zero, and sometimes it acts like a, a Why does a that make it... Number. It's just weird. Well, it's you can dangerous. divide by it, which is always... If you're, you're, you're by look, dividing by I, zero, I, then, you, then you get mathematical chaos. I, I think that what Jim has pointed out is, is exactly it, is one of the limitations of philosophy, really, is that, um, if you'll forgive me... Um, I'm, I'm a journalist, not that, a He won't forgive you, but care. just keep talking. Okay. Yeah. Is that... There, you're absolutely right. There are th some things that are impo essentially impossible to get an intuitive conception of, and that's just a limitation of the fact that we're classical human beings who weren't, who didn't evolve to understand, you know, to right. intuitively understand quantum mechanics. So there's lots of things in science that are impossible to get any intuitive handle on, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. I completely agree with you, and I think that a state of absolute nothingness, even though we can't envisage it in our minds. It's logically consistent. It's a real possibility. And there is a, you know, a genuine question, why is there a universe rather than absolute nothingness? Well, let me take uh, that to Rich Gott here. Rich, you've done a lot of thinking about the early universe, about the expansion of the universe. Uh, you're a universe guy, you're a cosmos guy. And at some point, you had to wonder what was outside of the cosmos itself, or what birthed the cosmos. If not from nothing, then what? Well, okay, let me, um, <clears throat> let me go talk about what he just said. Um, uh, let me try to give you an idea of two different kind of nothings that we're going to talk about. And since I'm a visual guy... Wait, wait, so there are two kinds of nothing. There are two kinds of nothing we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm, talk I'm going to talk about three. He's got three. A third you got a fourth one. over here? <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> I didn't know this. All right. We have more than one nothing. All right, Rich, put up your two nothings. We'll look at them. Okay, well, you, you take space, you get rid of the atoms, you get rid of the people in the room, you get rid of the air, you get rid of the photons that are flying around, and you get empty space, which is a, the, the vacuum. Uh, and, and this is what a lot of people think about when they think about nothing, a big, empty, dark, you know, we heard a big, empty, dark space. That's, that's a quantum vacuum state. And if you want to visualize that, just, just close your eyes. All right. That's what it looks like. <laughs> it's black, okay? It has a color. It's black. Now, um, that's what empty space looks like. It's alive with virtual particles and things. It has fields in it. Uh, Larry will tell you about that. Wait, wait, Rich, I have to interrupt for a moment. Before quantum physics was discovered and developed in the 1920s, yes. your concept of no matter, no energy, no particles, no people. There, you did, there was no place else to go after that. Well, Einstein thought empty space was empty, mm -hmm. and you had geometry. So, mm -hmm. so you, had, you had Einstein's field equations where you say, here's how stuff 
that you're talking about, uh, curve, space, and time. And over here, you could put a zero, and then you get equations that would tell you how space and time was curved. So space and time were still there, but uh, uh, there was zero energy density in there. Okay, so and, quantum and, physics yeah. stuck energy into that that the classical physics could not. Or well, didn't know what to the, do. It stuck the possibility of it yeah. there. Mm -hmm. okay. And I mean, it could be zero, and still you have interesting virtual particles and things. Physicists were quite used to thinking of a vacuum as zero energy density, but uh, quantum mechanics also allows you to have a non zero energy density. And um, if you have a non zero energy density, that means some energy per cubic centimeter. Um, you have also accompanied with that a negative pressure because um, the laws of special relativity tell you that if everybody who flies through this in a spaceship is going to see the same energy density, no matter what velocity they're traveling at, then you have to have a negative pressure. That's just how pressure and energy transform in special relativity. Now, positive pressure, you got that in the tires of your car. It pushes out. Um, negative pressure is like a suction. But we have a positive pressure in this room of 15 pounds per square inch. But we, the, the weight of the pressure, atmosphere. Air pressure. But we don't feel it because it's constant. It's, it's not blowing us one way or the other because the pressure is the same all over. So in the universe, if you have this quantum vacuum state that has a positive energy and a negative pressure, it's the same all over, so you don't notice it. Except that Einstein's field equations told you that pressure gravitates as well as energy, and so that negative pressure operating in three directions, x, y, and z, three spatial dimensions, produces more gravitational repulsion than the energy does gravitational attraction. So there's an overall repulsion. So this causes space and time to uh, expand. Um, we've actually seen this. This, is, uh, this got the Nobel Prize recently for the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe because of this quantum vacuum state, because of the repulsion of this nothing, as you might say, this quantum vacuum state, the universe is expanding faster and faster. So that's evidence that, in fact, empty space is not nothing. That's right. No. It's em evidence that empty space is energy, not that it's not nothing. <laughs> you take, you look, you try and find out what's there. Try and measure particles or right, radiation. Right, it's energy. Nothing, doesn't that, no doesn't not there. nothing include well, something? Well, you know, the, that, and that, I think, the, you have to be a little careful. And, and Rich is right. The first definition of nothing, which I think is the biblical definition, is an infinite, dark, empty void. That empty void has energy, but it's still empty. There's no particles. You try and look in a region of space, take away all the particles, all the radiation. There's no stuff there. And that's nothing weighs something. Larry, uh, what about fields? There are, are fields no, there are no stuff? fields. You can't measure them. There are no, uh, there's nothing there. It has, just, a, it has a topology. It has a shape. It has, it's, okay. it's, it's a physical object. You're, Empty okay. space it's, is a physical object. It's, it's not. A, wait, wait, I want to get back to that. Wait, wait, wait. If Rich, you, yeah. Rich, you said that you take everything out of space, yet Einstein said there is still the geometry of the fabric of space-time. Yes. Yes. Do we have the right to say because there is the fabric of space-time, even though it's not curved, it's just not bent by any actual matter, does that prevent us now from calling that nothing? Because we have a description for what it is as fabric of space-time. Well, well, as that's kind of what Jim is getting at, right, Jim? Yeah. Well, but, yeah, but that's the first kind of nothing. And the point, you can, point is that's for a lot of people before physicists started talking about that kind of nothing having energy, they would have said that's a good enough definition of nothing for them, empty space. Now we know empty space is more complicated. So you might say that's not nothing, but then the, there's a next kind of nothing, which is no space at all. No space, no time. Okay, so let's get back to Rich yeah. on that. So I think we agree that this, uh, this classical understanding of nothing has been violated by our emergent understanding of oh, Einstein's relativity absolutely. and quantum physics. And the, f the first person to really say this was that this is... Uh, Lamatra said that, uh, the, that the Einstein's cosmological constant was really a vacuum energy state. He said this in 1934. So he's the first one to really identify with that. And, and, and another reason we identify that. Lamatra, that way, he's the Belgian priest? Is yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And physicist. And physicist, yeah. He, he, uh, he proposed a model with the Big Bang at the beginning yeah. and, a, and a coasting phase, which we don't see. 
and an accelerating universe at the end. So he, of the early people, he, he got a lot right. Okay. So um, we also know there's an early stage of the universe where we had an, uh, uh, an accelerated expansion called inflation. And what we got today is a low energy version of inflation. This is a version where the energy density in the vacuum was very high. We're talking, you know, like 10 to the 77 grams per cubic centimeter. This That's is, high. That is high. Yes, okay. <laughs> that, makes a, that makes a neutron star look uh, ethereal, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, that is a high density. Okay. Yeah, just to put that on the same page. Um, <laughs> we're, we're okay, if you take neutron star density and make a volume the size of Thor's hammer out of it, uh, it it'll cram a herd of 300 billion elephants into that volume of Thor's hammer. Uh, so, sure, uh, so, proceed. So, so this is very dense. It's expanding <laughs> very fast. It's doubling in size every 10 to the minus 35 seconds. And it's, as it expands, the, the energy density stays the same in this vacuum state, so it makes more of itself. And another interesting thing happens. Um, two observers in this are separated so fast by the stretching space in between them that the light beams can't, uh, can't make it from here to here anymore. So event horizons occur. This is, uh, there's parts of the universe that you cannot see. This causes Hawking radiation. Hawking, Gibbons and Hawking predicted this for this inflationary state. The Stephen Hawking. The of, Stephen yeah. Hawking. He did this right after he did the black hole radiation. He mm -hmm. said, you know, in the universe, if you have an inflating state, uh, you, you're going to have this Hawking radiation also. So, and so if you lived back there in that nothing, um, you're going to see hot thermal radiation, hot Hawking radiation. It's very hot. It's 10 to the 22 Kelvin. Uh, you know, this is very hot. Yes, very hot. Yes. I mean, so <laughs> the tidal forces are very large. They'll, they'll tear you apart in, you know, 10 to minus 35 seconds. Um, the gamma rays... Have a nice the, day. Yeah, right. Rich, you know... <laughs> the, the gamma rays Rich, will burn you Rich, was any good news up. in this, right? <laughs> but the gamma rays will burn you up, and, and the... Um, uh, and you will... you. I'll tell you what it looks like <laughs> for a Hell. brief instant. Well, it looks blindingly bright blue because thermal radiation, you know, would look bright blue. So, so it's, it's uh, we could say it's a quantum vacuum state. It's nothing, but it, it looks violently not nothing. Okay. Now, now the, the third, or well, the second nothing that I was talking Wait, about. Can I just jump in on that? Uh, Ava, you've worked a lot on... Excuse me, Eva. You've, you've worked a lot on this early inflation, inflation epic, sure. very early in the universe. Right. And when I think of that inflation era, uh, isn't that a, uh, doesn't that come from a time where there is no structure, but then we have structure now? Is that kind of something out of a nothing scenario? I, th I think so. I think that's what Richard was about to get to. You start with these fields in their the lowest energy state that they have. And um, the system is expanding rapidly, exponentially, in the way he was just describing. And that time dependence of the energy function is enough to take a system which starts in its ground state and excite it. It's not really any more complicated than that, but it's a beautiful theory of the origin of structure and testable. So. And w one of the neatest parts of it, which we don't celebrate enough, because we talk a lot, and probably you've had, I don't know if there are any of the sessions, about macroscopic quantum mechanics, which is the big thing, quantum computing. Wouldn't it be great to have quantum mechanics on macroscopic scales? The really neat thing, the most amazing miracle of inflation, is it takes quantum mechanics and turns it into us. It's quantum fluctuations that become galaxies and us. It's the most macroscopic quantum mechanics you can imagine. It is amazing, and it does it in a very simple way. It turns quantum mechanic fluctuations into density fluctuations in a simple and beautiful way. It's, a, it's amazing, and we should celebrate it. So well, I, wanted to make, sorry, I wanted to make one more comment about this discussion of the definition. So it's possible as a theorist to separate issues a little bit and think about turning off gravity but keeping quantum mechanics. And then you can you know, make a very precise 
statement about what the ground state of a system is. But you do this in your office? You turn off you, gravity? You do this in your you turn on quantum mechanics? You just do this? You do. You it's do California. This. It's California. <laughs> <laughs> These theorists, they're, they're lords of the cosmos. Go on. We don't have the budget for gravity, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Turn off gravity. Quant we have a quantum universe. Go on. Right. I'm just trying to separate that. I'm trying to say quantum mechanics, you know, with just quantum mechanics, you can define what you mean by the vacuum state, the zero energy state. You can even consider to be a little bit more mathematically precise what we call a gapped system, a system for which it takes a finite energy to excite it. And I think that's also a pretty good definition of, of nothing. Um, in fact, according to some of our modern theories which relate non-gravitational physics to a, a dual description in terms of gravity, the two are closely related. I'm betting that Jim Holt doesn't agree with your definition of nothing. Well, I was going to. I was going oh, okay, to. Well, what you, you, you have no, a third I, nothing. What we no, have, I have I, a third I, nothing. But, <laughs> well, then what, wait, 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 Jim, react to Eva. I, the, the only uh, even remotely persuasive definition of nothing I've heard from a physicist came from Alex Belenkin, who said, you know, imagine a closed uh, sp uh, spherical space-time. Imagine the, the surface of a ball. It's a finite uh, 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 space but it's, uh, it's it doesn't have any boundaries. Now imagine the ball shrinking down to a point. Its radius goes from finite, shrinks down to zero. So now you have a closed space-time of zero radius. This was uh, Alex Vilenkin's definition of nothingness. And he did some quantum mechanical computations and showed that given a closed uh, 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 space-time of zero radius, there's a finite probability that a little nugget of false vacuum will, will uh, spontaneously appear, will nucleate out of that, and that, by the, the miracle of uh, inflation, will evolve into the, the, the world we see around us. And I think that's a really nice story. But, uh, but wait, wait, there, wait, there, wait, there are two wait. problems with it. One problem is, is a closed finite, uh, a, a, a closed uh, uh, space-time of zero radius, is that really nothing? Well, there's no space and there's no time, so anything that exists in space-time can't be a part of it. But what about uh, physical laws? What about mathematical entities? What about you know, consciousness, value, all the things that are possibly non-spatial, non-temporal? Those aren't ruled out, so it, just, it seems to me okay, that the, so the notion saying, of nothingness is a very parochial we'll get point. You raise yeah. a really important point that I want to get back to. What you're saying is you could have a universe that's got nothing in it, but if laws of physics still apply in that universe, the laws of physics are not nothing. Uh, yeah, yeah, where, where are the laws there? of okay, physics? Ava. And, uh, okay, so, so, yes. so this is a very interesting uh, way to approach the problem. Take a space-time and shrink it. The problem is that general relativity, the description based on that, breaks down. Exactly. And now you need a, a theory that goes beyond it. There are candidates for this. The leading one is string theory. And let's talk about this briefly in string theory. Zero radius does not mean nothing in string theory. In some cases, in fact, it's equivalent to large radius for a cute reason having to do with light modes from strings winding around the small radius. Um, but more generally, uh, you can go where you're going instead by asking how many effective dimensions do you have? And you can ask that question by counting the, the density of states of the system that are available. And shrinking a space to zero radius does not necessarily reduce the number of effective dimensions in that sense. There are, uh, there are processes which do do that. These are processes which appear in topology changing, transitions, and in some resolutions of singularities in string theory. But it's a, it's a technical question that you're asking, and yeah. you, can, you can improve on that answer. But we're all whistling in the dark here. I mean, we don't have a final theory. Of course uh, we don't. We, you know, we, of course we don't. But we, yeah. we, we still have some rules, and we try uh, to. Rich, let it. me get back to your third. Oh. Okay. Your third nothing. Well, that's a, that's a second nothing there. The, okay. The, mm -hmm. the zero universe, and um, Leeson Lee and I didn't think that was exactly nothing. It's a quantum state. It knows about the laws of quantum mechanics and so forth. Indeed. Part, you know, so so we. we we did not think that was exactly nothing. So the, 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 the third one is what I would call really nothing. <laughs> no quantum state, no, no, no nothing, you know. And, and I want to tell you what that looks like, <laughs> okay? Wait, well, wait, you just said no nothing. Well, okay, that's bad. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to, okay. but, you know, our vocabulary is going to start well, mattering oh, okay, okay. really badly, you know, as we go forward. Here. Will correct so don't tell me the nothing you're about to describe is not nothing. Okay, go. Okay, so, so what does really nothing look like? Well, what does it look like back here? 
Is there a big black thing back here? A big black cape over here on here? No. <laughs> <laughs> not, not me, though. Okay, I'll stand over here and I'll repeat that. Go. Okay. <laughs> Go. It's, uh, it's not black back there. You don't have any retinal cells, you know, looking in that direction. So that's, that's, that's really nothing. It's not anything. It's not there. And so... Um, Lee Jing Lee and I thought that of Lincoln's model, which we thought was very interesting, what they're trying to do there is make uh, uh, quantum tunneling is weird. You can be in the room and then tunnel out without going through the wall, that kind of thing. Uh, it's weird, and so we are looking for something weird to, to start the universe. Wait, wait just to, to get people on the same page of quantum tunneling. So quantum tunneling, if it happened uh, in the real world, um, you'd be on one side of a mountain, and rather than having to climb up the mountain, come down the other side, you would instantaneously just appear on the other side. And, and, uh, and quantum particles do this all the time. In fact, you, the sun cannot produce energy without a form of quantum tunneling. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's a barrier in the way, and how do you get to the other side? And I think in the movie A Buckaroo Banzai in the 10th <laughs> dimension, uh, he would go through mountains it, yeah. for just this way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Three of you saw that movie, apparently. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a great movie. It's about a rock star physicist. I like it. Uh, he, so, yeah, he, so he, he, he said, very wise, everywhere you go, go. there you are. Exactly. <laughs> right. exactly. The quote of the movie, it's yes. Great, okay, um, so, so your nothing is not even anything, is what your point is. Yeah, and so, so we, were, we thought we'd try something uh, different. We, we thought that... Uh, it was, uh, might be hard to make a universe out of nothing, particularly relying on something that, by definition, didn't exist. So uh, <laughs> we, we thought, well, maybe the universe isn't made out of nothing. It's made out of something, and that something could be itself. Um, and so um, inflation allows you to do this. And, um, I knew there was something in there. You knew there was something in there. Now, this is the Rich, do you have the universe in, the tup comes, in that Tupperware? It never comes without a visual aid. <laughs> This is the model. Universe in a Tupperware on. container, yes. So, so, so here's a picture of our model. It looks like something Dr. Seuss invented. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this glass represents space-time. We're showing one dimension of time going up this funnel here. That's an, that, the, this is an inflating universe here. The circumference is getting bigger as time goes up here. Um, we're showing uh, this is an inflating universe. And um, uh, Linde, who's at Stanford, showed that uh, quantum fluctuations that we've heard about can cause a universe to form, give birth to another universe here. Uh, and so this is a universe, baby universe, born, and this is called chaotic inflation. Uh, this is a universe born by quantum fluctuations off of this one. It's a branch that grows up to be as big as this trunk. And then it can sprout branches of its own. But so, Rich, phenomenon. you're holding in your hand four universes. Is that correct? You're just four. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not heavy. They're my universe. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, these are four universes. Now, what intrigued uh, Neil about this is that he say, well, well, what's outside here? What's this expanding into? Nothing. The only thing that's real here is the glass model itself. It's, it's curved, it has a shape, but to visualize it, we put it in this background space, but the background space doesn't exist, uh, just the glass itself. So uh, here's the universe coming off here. So uh, Lee Jing Lee and I said, well, uh, what about if one of the branches simply branched off here, circled back in time, and grew up to become the trunk? This is possible if you have a time travel solution in general relativity, of which they exist. Um, it, it makes a little closed uh, time loop here. And uh, if, you, if you go, and the universe is inflating, so this branch gets bigger and bigger as it comes back here, and the trunk is bigger than the branch. And so if you're, if you're here um, and, and you went around this, you would be able to come back in time and visit the event uh, where you are. This is a time travel to the past in general relativity. Um, so uh, uh, this is what this looks like. Um, every event here has events that preceded and caused it in the usual way. So if you're here, there's an earlier event here. There's an earlier event here. There's an earlier event here. 
And so if you go back in time, you go back further and further, and then you start going around. It's like the earth has no easternmost point, although it has, uh, it's finite toward the east. And so we thought this might be useful for addressing the you know, famous first cause problem. Uh, this universe uh, is finite to the past, but it has no uh, earliest event. And the interesting thing about this was that um, uh, this geometry here um, uh, explained the usual causal set of events we have where uh, photons go only toward the future. If you, if you shake a photon here, it goes out and intersects Alpha Centauri four years from now because it's four light years away. Um, Maxwell's equations allow uh, what's called advanced waves that go to the past and would, inter would be shown intersecting Alpha Centauri four years ago. But we don't see them in nature. So it must, it doesn't have anything to do with electrodynamics. It must have something to do with the beginning of the universe. So in this case, if you, the only self-consistent solution for this is one where photons go toward the future. Because if you had one that came back here, it would come back here, go around an infinite amount of time, gaining energy all the time, and blow up and cause a singularity and not be the geometry you started with. That'd be like killing your grandmother. <laughs> so you're not allowed to do that because uh, you have to have a self-consistent solution. So it also explained the entropy area of time because this was cold. Wait, so you're creating hot. the universe out of itself rather out than out itself. of nothing. Yes, we, we were right. asking the okay. question, can the laws of physics allow the universe to create itself? Are there laws of question physics mark. out here? No. There's nothing out there. So That's what, real. What, what, okay, what, you happy with yeah, that? No, it's I'm not, not even. Happy. What tells the abyss that it's pregnant with this thing? That's, I mean, I mean every, it's finite in time. Every event has a cause. There's no first what, moment. That's Why does what, it exist? That's it exists what eternally. Mr. Yeah. Leibniz would say, and listen, Leibniz's answer was God. Um, Leibniz, as they say, smart guy, invented calculus. Um, Leibniz's uh, question was, why is there something rather than nothing? We were just trying to answer the question, how did the universe get here? So uh, if we say, given that the universe is here, uh, uh, how did it get here? This was a possible way to do it. So Rich, um, your universe always was. That's your answer. Well, if I think four-dimensionally, like Einstein, I'd say I got this four-dimensional sculpture here that doesn't change. It's a four-dimensional thing. It exists. And so Mr. Leibniz would rightly ask, so why is it there? <laughs> Instead of not there. Or instead no. of something else. Well, or wait, wait, wait. That, according, that, that evolved according to completely Charles, different That's what he would yeah. Charles, yeah. If Charles. Were here. We, we got, didn't claim to answer that. Charles, if in your study of zero, you studied uh, Eastern philosophy, right? And we have some people arguing over here about basically first causes, right? And I'm just curious, I don't study Eastern philosophy. Around the world, are people as disturbed at the need to have to have a first cause? Because that's what's driving all this. It's like, well, how did it get here? I have to know. It is a problem to be solved. Is there anyone in the world who's just cool with that? <laughs> I can't say I've studied philosophy as extensively as to answer that universally, but almost all mythologies... Universally mean earthwide. Yeah, earth in, in this house, <laughs> universe means the universe, okay? So, like, Miss Universe? No, she's Miss Earth, all right? Just, let's just establish that fact now. Continue. Well, this Earth has but, the home, core, home planet advantage, so that's not fair. <laughs> never. That's right. But basically every, every mythology, more or less, needs a creation mythos of some sort. Um, basically, the two two functions of uh, a mythology are explaining where we came from and where we're going. Um, and the- So the urge was there. The urge was there. The urge the was there. pre-scientific era. Let me, look, you, you, we don't need a, the point is science doesn't worry about a first cause. I mean, you're pretending it does, but it doesn't. Religion does. Uh, the, the, first of all, there are, there are lots of good physical definitions of nothing, and I still think the best physical definition of nothing is the absence of something. So to understand nothing, you have, so to, we're understand, done. You have, you have to understand what something is. That's why it's a physical question and not a philosophical one. First, you have to understand what something is, and you have to understand what the absence of that is. All those are physical questions, and physicists try to answer them. Now, there are, there are a number of different answers which we can get to, and, and Rich has talked about some of them. There's still, the, the simplest thing is not to take it to zero 
radius, which is, as, as Eva pointed out, is not physical, at least most of us think it's not physical. Qu quantum, if, when you apply quantum mechanics to gravity, and we don't, we're, we don't have a quantum gravity theory yet, some people think we might be getting close, but, but we don't know if it is. But one of the things is quantum mechanics says things fluctuate, and if gravity is a theory of space and time, if you make space and time quantum mechanical variables, then it is perfectly possible for universes to pop into existence. Space and time Larry, to pop into existence where there was no space and time before. Hold on, now, hold on. Wait, wait, hold on. Hold on. I haven't had a chance to talk hold yet. Hold on. So I, I must ask a question here. What? Space and time pop into existence. You make that sound like a temporal process, a process in time. Well, because I it's said so you can understand it. Huh? No, no, I mean, I used words, and the problem with words <laughs> right. are, as T.S. Eliot says, they're sort of slippery. They're, right. They're, okay, it, how about this? But becoming well, I know implies come, time. I, you, you, know, you can't have time coming into existence yeah, as itself a temporal process. That well, makes no sense. Well, That's why pop, it's good to have philosophers close, around, which I'm not one to close, help you use language okay. precisely. And so let me just pretend there, let me, t let me just say that there's a global time, and at some time, a space pops into existence. Okay, okay will that make so. you happier? Okay, there, there's okay. a global but, time, and well, then there's a global time. Just to clarify. Just to clarify. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, wait, I have to, okay. Just so I understand what's going we have on. How many nothings, so and we have global time. Wait, and hold okay. on, just yeah. so I understand what's going on. Lawrence, mm -hmm. you are saying that because we have quantum, because we are illuminated by the actions of quantum physics, it, mentally, we can think about whatever is our best understanding of nothing, and quantum physics then pops into existence in that nothing, an entire universe. And if that's the case, I would then pick up Jim's point and ask you... I was you, going to try and ask, where did the quantum physics come from? No, 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 that's okay. not what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to okay. ask you, that had to happen at some point. Why? Why isn't it happening all the time, it can everywhere, be. at all it, times? First of all, it can be, and it wouldn't be noticeable at all. Okay, it could be happening in our universe. You'd be popping off baby universes, but they would disappear from our universe. Okay, why you don't you like them. his nothing that he built his universe but in? But that's... Okay. Why don't you like his nothing? That sounded like a good thing. Well, first nothing. of all, as he himself admits, his something, his nothing is a something. And well, when you start with a contradiction, you can drive anything. Let me, but you know, let me get to the point. Go. The key point yeah. is this question. First of all, it's the question is why is there something? It has structure, it's, it obeys laws, hold, hold, complex hold, laws, hold, there's hold, a lot hold, of stuff going on. I mean, my bank account, where there's no money in it, is, is, is still something. And, yeah, and the vacuum is a hell of a lot more uh, of something okay. than, than my but, bank account. Okay, well, no, you, the point is that. Our, the key question is really, the why question is stupid. Uh, okay, everyone who no, has kids not, knows no, that. I, I, wait, wait, what, no, which no, why question are you talking about? Eventually you keep saying, why, 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 why? The only answer is go to bed. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and so the, the point is that what we really mean is how. That's the, that's what we, when we say why, what we really mean is how. We care how did it happen. Now the question may, isn't, was there something else that existed? The really amazing thing, the question that really matters, and it may not be the question that matters to some classical philosophers, but it's the question that really matters is, how did a universe of 400 billion galaxies containing 100 billion stars, how did that come into existence if there weren't galaxies, if there weren't stars, if there wasn't energy? And that is the question that physics is coming close to answering. And, and that may not be the ultimate question of whether there was nothing before that, but there was nothing, our universe didn't exist. And our universe coming into existence when it wasn't there in the beginning with enough, with zero energy, but still enough gravity to create everything we see is the amazing, remarkable miracle it is, it that, is amazing. that science creates. And that's you, the yeah, important yeah, question. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great story. It's, it's, it, there's lots of empirical evidence for it. You've told a miraculous story about how a universe like ours was spawned by a piece of rubber. But where did the piece of rubber come no, from? No, no. And the point is that even the laws don't have to exist. There could oh, be, that's there, okay. in the, in the multiverse... Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, you yeah, said yeah. a quantum fluctuation but brings the universe into existence. That's because I can talk in our universe about quantum mechanics, but it could be, although this is wild. It, it, oh, in, nothing in, else we've been talking about until now in, is wild, in a, but this is wild. Okay, yeah, go. This is even wilder. Okay, so it's quite plausible. In fact, if there are many universes, as, we, as, as, as current the, theories the suggest, that in each of them, the laws of physics essentially come into existence when the universe comes into existence, there are different laws of physics then in each universe. Then you can't invoke but, a quantum fluctuation oh, uh, but to maybe, give you the universe but that I don't has know, quantum fluctuations. But what is interesting to me, and I, can't, I have no mathematical underlying theory of this, but it's perfectly possible, it seems to me, that some of those universes don't even have quantum mechanics. I don't know if quantum mechanics arose when our universe right, arose. Ava, I keep calling you Ava. Ava. I mean, I can only describe it mathematically okay. by, quantum, by, by, by a theory right now, but I don't know, you know, the, 
String well, theory is okay, quantum I, field okay, theory. Okay. I met okay. Eva on the campus of Stanford a couple of months ago when I happened to be in town. And the uh, first time I met her, and I, she had already been invited to this, and we just chatted about nothing. And so she went on and... <laughs> so it was something, but it was nothing, right? So we're chatting on, and then at one point, she described a nothing to me that just blew my mind. Okay, so Eva, could you give it... Because the nothing you described to me just would send all of us home in three minutes, okay? Because we're done after the nothing you described to me. I was like, I went out saying, damn, I, I can't even... So could you please just... I'm not sure I could live down to that, but I'll try. Okay, just to give me that nothing, and you all just shut up and listen to this. Okay, go. Go. Well, so I already said... My... I'll get a close listen on this. Okay, uh, go. All right. I already said my conservative view of nothing, which is inflationary density perturbations, but, but let me come to this more um, ambitious question that's being discussed. And there is a model, I think, for what you're, you're referring to. It happens to be a model within string theory, but yeah. maybe there would be more general approaches to that. Uh, which, which basically proceeds um, as follows. So space-time is an emergent thing. Large radius space-time is, is what we think is rather special. It's, it's the exception rather than the rule. And it can evolve toward a singularity or evolve out of a singularity. But let's consider the case where it's evolving toward a singularity. And what can happen is time can keep going forever. But in effect, the masses of all the fields, including the graviton, exponentially grow. So there's a... a pretty controlled model of this in string theory. It's a classical version of what is called the hartle hawking wave yeah. function. Um, and so, you know, we can make sense of that. We can do computations of, you know, if we assume we're in the vacuum in this exponentially massive phase, we can ask, what does that state correspond to in the, in the time periods when there is a large space time? So we get an answer for that. It's a simple thermal distribution of particles. So, you know, these are questions that we can begin to try and address using technical tools that we're developing. We're far from answering the ultimate questions. No one would ever say otherwise. Um, but, but the I don't fact see, that it's yeah. implausible is what's well, no, really you, you described something about dimensions and it went yes, away? Yes, yes. You're getting so, there. Okay. Well, that's right. So, so um, Damn. as you... <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so as you uh, approach this phase, you can make this count of the density of states that I alluded to earlier. So you can ask within string theory, what is dimensionality anyway? Um, since large space is, a, is the exception, there we can just count dimensions by asking how many directions we can move in. More generally, we, don't, we can't do that. So one thing you can do that's a little more general is to ask uh, you know, how many dimensions in effect can a string oscillate into? And that affects the density of states that, that the string carries. So how many different states of the system you can have. So if you have a string, it oscillates, and the, it has more states if it can oscillate in more dimensions, but you don't have to have a large space time in order to ask the question of what is the density of states of, of, of a string. But just to um, clarify, and, if, and you you have, can, if you have a string that's just sort of uh, in two dimensions, you can jiggle it and it'll wiggle that way. If you have three dimensions, it can wiggle in more ways. In more ways. Four dimensions, it goes out of what your awareness is, and right. so... And so the, the number of states actually grows like the exponential of the square root of the number of dimensions when there's a, a normal I, notion I was going to tell you that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so what you do is you define an effective dimension where you just ask, uh, you know, this is growing like e to the something, like exponential of something, and you, and you define that something as the square root of the effective number of dimensions. And now that quantity can change, and as you go toward a singularity like what we're talking about, it can, it can decrease, and I think that's what we were talking about. And it decreases until what happens? Well, the best way of describing it in words is that the masses of everything grow exponentially as you approach this, this point. But that's not what you told me in your office. <laughs> <laughs> no, you told me that some, there's some state where the, all the dimensions go away themselves. Well, that's what, that's what I'm saying. So as you, as you go, Oh, that was what you were saying? I'm sorry, I yeah, missed yeah. that. Did no, I? no. <laughs> Okay, let, let me try and close the gap. Let me okay. try and close the gap. So, so, so I've said two things, I guess. One is that, in effect, the masses are growing exponentially, and then I've also said you can measure the effective dimension by asking about the density of states. So let me just say, as you go toward this phase where the masses are growing exponentially, that number, the effects of dimensionality, is decreasing. Until? Until zero. You Until you don't even have dimensions. Right. Okay, so, so your fugelhorn theory here... <laughs> That's in some dimensionality, isn't it? 
Well, it's embedded it, in something that presumably has a larger it. dimension than well, what it's embedded no, in. It, it just has the number of dimensions it has, which I'm saying is four. You know. Yeah, but it exists <laughs> in a. No, 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 well, no, that's just to help you visualize it. <laughs> Out there is nothing. It's, it, <laughs> in, 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 in theory, you can. I mean, it, the string theory can predict many universes uh, with all, all sorts of dimensions, and and and, and four-dimensional universes might pop into existence and, and six-dimensional universes and two-dimensional universes. We don't happen to live in those. Okay, what, uh, is there a highest number of dimensions that could possibly represent reality? Well, it depends on the theory, I, I suppose. Uh, uh, one might say... Ten, That's ten a cop-out answer. I just want you to no, know. Let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me very quickly address that. You were about to say 10. 10 is a special dimension in string theory yeah. because it is the dimension in which you have what is called supersymmetry, ex extra symmetry. Mm -hmm. But it's in no way predicted by the theory, in yeah. fact you can start, as you were just saying, in any number of dimensions. The difference between any other dimension than 10 and, and dimension 10 is that in any other dimension, there's potential energy from the start in your analysis. That's but, the only difference. But the point about this is that the answer to the question is really, it has to be, it's not, the interesting question is not why is there something rather than nothing. The amazing question would be why is there nothing rather than something, but we wouldn't be here if Ask the question. If it's not. But I mean, the point is, there should. It, it would be amazing to have nothing. There's always going to be something. It's going to rise sometime, somewhere, and you happen to live where it is. Uh, Charles, did people debate zero when it was first introduced? Uh, yeah, it was. It was a. Who didn't like it? Well, it, it zero uh, was hated by the Greeks in particular uh, because. It, so they didn't have bank accounts that went to zero. Like, <laughs> like Jim's bank account. They only had zero for Jim's bank account when they borrowed from the Babylonians. They actually did. Uh, they did um, astronomical calculations um, in Greek numbers, and then when they realized they needed a zero to make the calculations easier, they would swap into base 60 and use Babylonian zero and the symbol for they zero. They did take from the Babylonians. They took it from the Babylonians, but they did Base 60, so we owe our measurement of the clock time to them, which is That's essentially correct. base 60. That's 60 correct. seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. That's correct. And, okay. and it was so repulsive to the Greeks that they refused to incorporate it into their own system. That it was uh, basically a calculational tool that was used by uh, the geeky astronomers, and we forget about it uh, the rest of the time. So is there some modern counterpart? Because we're still human, just as they were. And we have a, a philosoph philosophically informed gentleman here who just can't stand what's going on to his right. And, <laughs> and every, they're grappling over some physical representation of nothing, and he's saying, whatever you've done, you still haven't given us nothing. So is this, is this just the same argument moving forward? Uh, I, think, I think in terms of, there's an aesthetic underlying fight here. Uh, in, in, uh, for, for because uh, Lawrence loves mm -hmm. his zero, you know, his universe from nothing. He's aesthetically turned on by that. I can feel it when I walk yeah. near him. Okay, that's just personal attraction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, there's there's all sorts of things that that some of us uh, it takes time to change your aesthetics to accept. I mean, if you look what at what you're saying is some of the resistance was philosophically driven philosophical. rather than practically driven. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If you look at the turn of the century, I mean... Uh, no, we've got to uh, really specify which century you're talking about now. <laughs> this, this uh, well, yeah, the turn of the 19, 1900. Okay, thank uh, you. If, if you look at that time, but the, uh, atomic theory was relatively new, and uh, uh, modern atomic theory was relatively new, and there were physicists who were Just to clarify, there, the atom was still a controversial topic even in 1900, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah. It wasn't accepted until yeah. after 1905. Yeah. There were big conferences on the... No so atoms. Brownian motion, I guess. Yeah, yeah. really, Einstein. Einstein. And, okay. and, I, th I think and it was Ernst Mach who said, if, if atoms are true, I'm, I'm resigning. I'm giving up my uh, uh, position. Similarly... Uh, and he was begging in the street, you know, a few weeks later. Exactly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. um, he didn't believe in quantum mechanics either. Planck, uh, you know, essentially, even though he invented it. And, and uh, Einstein, even though he was yeah. one of the founders of quantum mechanics, well. yeah. found it aesthetically repulsive. And yeah. some of his contributions, his best contributions, were trying to show that it was garbage. But and that's so, what's great yeah. about science. It takes what's aesthetically repulsive. It says the universe doesn't exist to please you. You know, you may like it, but it doesn't matter. 
It may not be true. Yeah, but and if Jim it's true, Holt you got to learn to like it. Jim Holt wants the universe to please him. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a crappy, mediocre universe. It's badly designed. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 the most interesting, the father of chaotic inflation, Andre Linda, told me that uh, it would not be hard for a Just slightly a departmental more colleague of Yes, of that's right, to make a, a universe uh, in a lab. A, a, a hacker a physicist in another universe could make a universe like ours in a lab with just a, you know, a 10 to the minus uh, 9 uh, uh, grams of uh, matter. And, uh, and, it, and in fact, when you look at how imperfect and weird our universe is, it probably was made by a hacker. I mean, maybe there was a creator, <laughs> but certainly wait, not wait, stop, an omniscient. Stop, wait, you're saying... No, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, why are there 60 plus elementary particles? That is so inelegant. I, if I were designing a universe, it would be far more elegant than that. It would have, right? it actually it would have nothing in it, probably. Uh, no, so I mean, why enough, four I mean, forces? Why you know, all these, you know, why all this symmetry breaking? Uh, no, no, in fact, you know, these... people say, one of the things that I really hate, and, and I've debated recently in Sweden with theologians, is they say, well, they get this stuff that physicists talk about fine-tuning. They make it sound as if our universe is beautifully fine-tuned for life. It's actually could be much more beautiful and have life in it. And, and it's, it turns out that there are lots of constants we don't understand, and they look unnatural, and maybe they are, and maybe it's fine too, but it doesn't mean it's the best universe. But it's what. But again, what's surprising about that? Bees can see the colors. It's cosmic natural selection. Bees can see the colors of flowers because they couldn't. They couldn't reproduce. If you know the constants of nature happen to allow us to exist, but that's not so surprising. What would be more surprising is they didn't, and we still did. Rich, what's the the famous quote from Alphonse the Tenth? Oh, oh sorry. Think, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's I thought, I thought, I thought you were going to say, is this, is this the best of all possible worlds? Um, <laughs> no, Alphonse, we, nobody we remembers have, this quote? Is that Alphonse the 10th? No. no. Why do you tell no, us? No, that's Leibniz. Leibniz, Leibniz again. Leibniz, is this okay. the best of yeah. all uh, possible Alphonse worlds? Alphonse the 10th, was it the 1300s, something around there, he said, had I been around at the time of creation, oh. I could have given some suggestions for God to have improved okay. uh, his work. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Upon looking at the actual vagaries of nature. There's a lot of folks like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, well, so Rich, I remember here's something nice. Here's something nice about the multiverse. I mean, we what we know about the Big Bang is uh, the Big Bang seems to be started by inflation. That, that, this is gravitational repulsion from the negative pressure that started the Big Bang explosion, and it seems to make. Uh, uh, multiple universes. Well, you saw four of them here, and and it just it, there's no stopping it, and so it just keeps on making more and more universes. So, uh, and I proposed the early model this in 1982, a multiverse with all, all these different universes, and 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 Linde has quite said uh, that you know the laws of physics in these different bubble universes or these different branch universes can can be uh, uh, quite different. So, so. Now here's the different nice in laws of physics. Yeah, different uh -huh. different well, laws of physics. Not that Martin different. Rees would say they're different. There's one so they're laws the of physics, which is sort of string theory, let's say, and, and there's different bylaws here, and there's bylaws here uh, because the different vacuum states and the different uh, multi universes evoke different laws of physics. And so uh, here's the nice thing: if if you have a multiverse with an infinite number of universes here. Um, some of them are nicer than others. <laughs> Some of them are completely hostile and, you know, they're really hot and no intelligent life can live over there. And so, luckily, you don't live over there. <laughs> and, and the universes that are more habitable, more people will live in. This is the anthropic principle. So you're, uh, some universes are populated by more intelligent beings. Some universes are populated by less intelligent beings. And so you're likely to live in one of the nice universes. But, you know, Thank you. Exactly. But, you know, our universe is actually pretty hostile. I always get amazed when people say yes, our universe is friendly life. Most of our universe is damn hostile. Yeah, yeah. The universe wants to kill us at every opportunity it has. it's amazing we've been here this long. Remember it's, that uh, asteroid that just yeah. came? Yeah, I mean, that's it's exactly. Amazing. There will be another one coming in the future. The universe is out to kill us and has been since we've been w w evolved. And it, Jim. And, you know, and in but fact, still. it's not so clear that, uh, in fact, there are dangers of using the anthropic argument, too, because it assumes typicality. I often say, if, if you use the anthropic argument for, peop, for intelligent life, we should be having this discussion underwater. Just to clarify, the anthropic... Three quarters of the Earth is underwater. Uh, no, no, of the I surface would, of the Earth. I would say... Right. So, wait, wait. So, the anthropic principle, just to put everyone on the same page, is the premise that uh, you can marvel at whatever universe we're in, for whatever regions 
Most of those occasions are theological, yet, uh, so, but the anthropic argument would say, correct me if I don't, if I mess this up, I think I have it right. So, so the universe that allows you to make that argument is the universe that allows you to exist to make that argument. And so, so there are people who want to then say the universe was made for us. Well, they're, they're, the point is there are people who would say, and we said it, physicists have said it for many different times over the last century, it's always been wrong, but maybe it's right this time. There's some quantities, like the energy of empty space, that seem so inexplicable from a fundamental physics perspective that people are saying, well, it is true that if it was much bigger than what it is, there'd be no galaxies. And there are galaxies, there'd be stars, no stars, no planets, no astronomers, so the universe is the way it is, so there are astronomers to measure it. And it sounds religious, but it's really, or tautological, but it's not. It could be true that it's kind of a cosmic natural selection. As I say, you just find yourself living in universes in which you can live. It's per perfectly plausible. Where I, where I take umbrage at it is some people who make, make, then make the claim that they can argue, they can understand why the fundamental constants are what they are, but that makes some presumptions about typicality, about us being typical life forms. And I don't happen to think we're typical life forms. We happen to exist pretty early on in the history of a universe that looks like it's going to exist a lot longer. And I suspect, there'll be, lots of years of, I suspect there'll be lots of life forms that are quite different from us in the future. So I don't think we're necessarily typical. We just happen to be here. Jim, every well, time you've opened your mouth, you, it has been in part to pass judgment on other people's uh, <laughs> offerings of a, of a nothing. Uh, do you actually have a nothing to put on the table other than arguments against other nothings that come sure, before sure. you? No, I mean, first of okay. all. <laughs> 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 okay. I would say philosophers have talked a great deal of uh, nonsense about nothing. And um, the, if, you, if you look at the philosophers who've addressed nothing in the history of philosophy, the earliest one was Parmenides, the Eleatic Sage, and he said uh, uh, that, that we cannot speak of what is not. And in saying that, he violated his own precepts. So he got off to a very shaky start. Then we have uh, uh, Hegel saying Wait, that the act that of saying you being, can't speak of what is not meant yeah. he was speaking of what is not. Exactly. Okay. Yes, That's exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We I'll can speak of what is not. I can speak for example. Oh, no, I was going to make a great bad joke. Uh, so moving on to Hegel. Hegel uh, said, what is pure being? Pure, indeterminate being. It has no qualities. It's the same thing as nothing. So Hegel said being equals nothingness, which is a great deal, very close to what you say. Uh, also uh, nonsense, but harmless nonsense. <laughs> Thank you. Heidegger <laughs> thought of nothing as an annihilating force that sucks things into existence and keeps them there, it kind of like the, the vacuum cleaner in Yellow Submarine that sort of sucks up all the scenery and sucks up the Beatles and it sucks up itself and it nothings himself and then the world pops back into existence. The 60s and, was good to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, but, 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 but analytic philosophers, serious philosophers in the, in the tradition that I, I think is, is the, the greatest uh, today, say, you know, that nothing is, it, 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 it's a noun, so it seems like a name for an entity, but it's not. It just means not anything. There's nothing particularly mysterious about it. Uh, and so nothingness is a state in which there's not anything, period, in, in, the including, something there, including fields uh, in, the, in, in vacuum and so forth. But there's no vacuum. But, but, so, but, but then we should ask, why do we assume that the, the fact that there's a world rather than nothing requires an explanation? What's so special about nothing? And people say, well, nothing is well, the simplest. Does everybody require that explanation that you've seen around the world? Because you said it requires it, but that could be a, a Western well, uh, mandate that you've, we've put upon ourselves. The creation myth is always about how the world we live in came into existence. It may have evolved from an early, er, earlier chaotic state, or, or it may have been created out of nothingness by a god or something like that. There's only one, by the way, there's a, an Amazon tribe called the, the Pitaha, the, who I think is the only uh, civilization known that doesn't have any creation myth at all. When they ask about the world, they say, it's always been like this. Like Rich's yeah. thing, so Rich came yeah, yeah. from that tribe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but physics, physics would also always say, I mean, we're used to in quantum mechanics realizing that all, any possibility, anything that's possible can exist. Yeah. And so it, the, the an simplest answer is if a universe is possible, it has to exist. And it's not too surprising to find ourselves in it. Yeah, We're running but, low but, on but time. there are lots I'm, of other possible universes that don't exist. So yes. How do you I mean, know they don't exist? You like, sound like you've been there and looked for them and couldn't find them. So that, I mean, that's interesting. You're positing a sort of a principle. It's it, uh, traditionally called the principle of plenitude or fecundity. 
that every possibility is actual. No, I'm there just... Are, there are universes no, I'm not that are, that. That are ruled saying, over saying, by Greek gods and so forth. That's, no. That's an interesting that's metaphysical That's not what I said. Idea. You said yeah. that other kinds of universes don't exist. I just don't know how you have access to that information. No, I don't. I'm, I, it's possible that, that, that every possible universe governed by every imaginable combination of laws and even completely lawless universes, it may all exist out there. Mm -hmm. So, there, so it's, it's conceivable that every possibility is realized. I mean, this is an idea that goes back to Plato, and actually Steven Weinberg, who's the father of the standard uh, model of particle physics, entertains this uh, notion in his book, uh, Dreams of a Final Theory, The Principle of Plenitude. It would explain why this world exists. This world is just one world in an ensemble of all possible worlds, and one of these possible worlds is the null world. It's nothingness. So, in answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, you answer, well, there's not, there's both. So that, well, I mean, that's one way, okay. world, I, mean, I think that's and a very extravagant very, metaphysical. very rare. I mean, the point is most of the worlds are not null. And, and, and that's uh, why yeah. it's not too surprising yeah. to find yourself in not a null universe. But why do we think <laughs> that the, the null universe is, a, is the ontological default uh, uh, option? That's, that's what's, uh, you know, it is the simplest. It's, you know, it seems to be the least arbitrary. It's the cheapest. It doesn't cost anything. But actually, our but, universe but again, is pretty that's, cheap, that's too. It has zero, zero net energy. It's like Donald Trump. Lots of assets and lots of But we of have zero energy. Our universe, it, it, my point is, our working. universe has zero energy. It's huh? no different than our universe. Our total energy of our universe yeah. is probably zero. Yeah. So our universe that's is cheaper. cheap it so energy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of a free lunch. Likely to come from yeah. I want to go along the line here. We're running low on time. Plus, I want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience, from our Twitter stream, and from our overflow rooms. Uh, what's, what's the best, cleanest expression of zero you know? I think the mathematical expression, where you start with zero and you remove it and you get the null set. That's my favorite. Nothing. <laughs> uh, maybe it's the, that's the What, platonic. you start with zero and? You remove it and you get the null set. It's, it's almost a platonic nothing, which is... Well, wait, so the there's a zero, which is nothing, but then you remove the zero and you have a set of things that doesn't even include nothing. That's correct. That it, it That's is, an awesome nothing. It is the emptiness of, of all. It's, it's, there's, there's nothing It's so all. empty, it doesn't even have zero. That's right. Oh, you, that's you, can actually, you can actually create zero out of the null set if you try. You, you can you, create zero you, out of the null there's, set. There's, there's a mathematical formalism that allows you to take the set of the null set and put it in a set, and that becomes zero. Yeah, I'm moving on right now. OK. <laughs> 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 so Jim, your best nothing is what? Not anything. It's a, it's, it, that's the theory of nothingness. I'm sorry, it's no more interesting than that. And that's why, by the way, philosophers spend very little time vexing over the, uh, the concept of uh, nothingness. It's not that complicated. Um, so, so yeah, all although hard, hard to imagine. Well, Once again, professional bullying on television. Wait, wait, so, uh, so Jim, so you're saying all the philosophers are just, who are still yeah, arguing nothing should just spend, listen to you. No, they, no, they don't spend, it's not, it's not a fruitful philosophical notion unless you, 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 you make heavy weather of it the way Heidegger did and say it's this annihilating force that should inspire angst within our breast. I mean, that's kind of fun. Or to imagine, you know, the world, you know, the world is a little sealed container of being surrounded, you know, floating in a sea of nothingness, and a little bit of nothingness leaks in when we go into the cafe and we expect to see Did you Pierre use the word angst? Yeah. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, I just thought I just caught up with okay, that so sentence. It's a philosophical <laughs> term. <laughs> so nothingness induces angst in us. Yeah. Uh, in, yes, it, it, in me it induces jollity. I, I, you know, we all have different temperamental reactions to it. Uh, Rich. You seem to be pretty cool with nothing. Well, I'd say um, not there. <laughs> um, okay. What does it look like? <laughs> what color is that? I mean, okay. <laughs> so that's not, not even there. black. It's not, not even, even a black. No, it, 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 it's just not there. So, Rich, is it fair for me? I don't want to stretch your analogy here because that was a good one. Um, <laughs> So, people ask, what, what happens to you when you die? You go to heaven or hell or wherever. And for me, the simplest explanation is, your, your awareness is such as what you knew of the world before you were born. Exactly. Right? And so that's as nothing as you can possibly come up, other than Shirley MacLaine, who's been reborn many times. <laughs> for the rest of us, that's pretty, that's, a, that's like what's behind your head, right? Because you, you don't even see it. You don't even know to think it's there. So your consciousness before you were born, that's a pretty good nothing, isn't it? 
Who knows? <laughs> Listen, we're all going to enter that state this tonight, is, by the way, when we go to sleep. I use this example because it's like right here. Okay. What are you saying, Jim? Uh, dreamless sleep. We'll all enter that state tonight for a little while. We'll, we'll have a little period of nothingness tonight during our dreamless sleep. And, uh, so there's no, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Like, we don't have to think, you know, what, what was going on before we're born. We, we dip into nothingness every night if we're lucky. The absence of consciousness is probably the least satisfying. Lawrence, what's your best enough? You have a whole book on this. Yeah, yeah. By the, way, by the way, all four of these gentlemen have books this evening offered for sale outside. We'll be at a table uh, for signing. Uh, Eva has to actually leave for Europe tonight, so she won't be able to join us at the table. So, Lawrence, what is your best nothing? Well, is I, it the I, whole universe itself? Because I wore a vest for you tonight. Yeah, okay? yeah. yeah I, know. I just want to say, <laughs> this, I've got the entire universe on my vest. <laughs> And you, you, I knew it would you, come out sometime. I knew it. <laughs> you tell you tell me all these stars, moons, planets, class came from nothing. Yep. Um, uh, look, there are a variety of forms of nothing. I try, and and different one, and they all have physical definitions. And you might not like any of them, but one is empty space. The other is no space, and the other is no space, no time, no particles, no no laws. And that to me is as good as as close as no to nothing as you can get. And in fact, as I see, I don't see why people have any problems with it. Each of these lights in this room emits a photon. The photon wasn't there before it was emitted. It wasn't in the electron. It wasn't in the atom. It was created from nothing. And some pe people don't have a problem with that. No, it was created from energy. Thing, created from energy. Happen. Lawrence, it was created from energy. And energy is not nothing. So I won't accept your photon. Analog. Well, it could. It, it, a zero Back up and say something Sorry, else. a zero energy <laughs> photon. A zero energy photon. Our universe could be like a zero-energy photon, a zero-energy total universe. And again, as I say, if you imagine that process and ask what the properties of such a universe would be, it would look like ours. I but I will accede, as I've always said, you know, and I say at the beginning of my book, that I will accede that the philosophers and theologians are, you know, no much more because they are experts at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not I, even well, humorous. Wait, wait, so, wait, so just, Lawrence, just to put it, just to close this out. Um, so your universe that's created out of nothing where there are no laws, no space, no time, no anything, that nothing had to know to create the universe. Well, there may have been something else there, but our universe was Oh, now there. you confess. I'm just trying to yeah, understand there because nothing. if there's no laws... Then there's nothing to know to create a universe. What if there's every law? Is that the same as no laws? That's the I point. Bet, maybe. I bet. Uh, I bet. Well, I think uh, Jim was sort of saying. I wasn't listening. Jim was alluding that to every possible, every possible law, every possible universe. Or maybe universes with no laws, or maybe universes with laws. That's the. That's certainly a possibility. All I'm saying is, if, if you have a place, whatever that is, there was where no place. If you're you have a no wrong. place with no laws, and then you birth a universe, something in that place had to know to birth that universe. Why? Okay. Why? If it's Maybe possible, not. why do you have to? You're assuming intentionality. You're making right. this. Eva, you're, you're, you're purporting to offer us an theology. explanation, and what? you're offering us no explanation. At all you're saying it just is. Yeah, he's kind of doing yeah. that. You're Eva. not talking about a process that's governed by I'm, laws, well, we by say, rules, in which we, we initial say what conditions the rules are, are that saying? caused our universe, but we don't ask, you know, what happened before. Because okay. we have control over their microphones. I just. <laughs> <laughs> Eva. Eva, give me just, your best argument okay. for nothing. I, I would just describe it as the absence of degrees of freedom. If you think about quantum field theory, again, just... We do that all the time, think about quantum <laughs> field theory. Yes. yes. What you do with it is you think about it on longer and longer distance scales, and there's a precise sense in which, as you do that, you lose degrees of freedom. And in a case uh, of quantum field theories which have a gap between the ground state and the, and the first excited energy level, you know, as you coarse grain over longer and longer scales, eventually you come to a place where you've lost all the degrees of freedom. So the ground state of a gapped quantum system would be my answer. The ground state of a gapped quantum system is your best nothing. Yeah, <laughs> good. I like that. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I kind of, my favorite nothing, not that anyone asked, but I will offer it, because uh, I'm host of the evening. My favorite nothing, I think, is what's outside of Rich's four universes. I, I kind of liked that because it's, you have no access to it, it's not even anything, and it's, it's behind the head of each of those universes, and I, I'm kind of leaning towards that. It doesn't even exist, which you may also like. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, let me offer just a final reflection on this. Um, <sighs> it seems to me that there was surely a time when nothing was just 
uh, I would say there's nothing between me and you. Then we learn that there's air, there's actual substance there, there's mass, there's energy, and so you couldn't call that nothing anymore. And then we learn that space has no air, and that's a relatively recent understanding. As, as late as the early 1600s, there were, there were arguments that maybe you could fly to the moon and by, by learned scientists. And the only way you could do that is if this air substance permeated the space between us and the moon. So now that when there's no air, so then space is the nothing. But then quantum physics, relativity tells us this stuff going on even in empty space. So that removes that from our nothingness. And now we have to actually exit the universe, either sort of theoretically in the sense that, that Eva is suggesting, or outside because you created a model that we can look outside the universe. Now that's a nothing. And I just wonder whether this nothing is an all-elusive moving target, that one day we will learn that you do create those universes out of a law of physics. It's the universe birthing law. And then there's a law in the place where we previously thought there was nothing. And then that just simply pushes the definition of nothing that much farther uh, away that you have to chase it down because then the space that has the law that we previously thought was nothing that birthed the universe, you can then ask, what birthed that? So maybe uh, nothing will never be resolved. Uh, and the only person who's content in his definition of nothing and it'll be permanent forever is Charles right here with his null <laughs> set. Join me in thanking the panel for this. So uh, we have two microphones up front. Uh, feel free to line up. We'll spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes answering questions. Then we call it a night. OK, so uh, we actually have questions in from Twitter. Uh, if you don't know what Twitter is, uh, it's one of the an extraordinary way to uh, waste your time. <laughs> Not quite as bad as Facebook, but it's up there. Uh, Okay, uh, what are some of the practical, I, I'm gonna take this to, to Lawrence. What are the, some of the prac, oh, this is from uh, PsychMez1 on Twitter. What are some of the practical applications that can come from the discovery that nothing is unstable and creates particles? Is there any practical application for that? Uh, well, I in quantum mechanics, there is. The kind of, when one's talking about a universe, I should say proudly, there's no practical application I can think of to any of the work I do. In, and and uh, and that's that's fine with me. Uh, in fact, it always amazes. Well, who me pays that, your salary? Well, is no, it fine no, with no, them? No, but look, I think that's look, the question. Neil, but the point is, people never ask what's the practical significance of a Mozart symphony or a Picasso painting. It's part of what makes being human worth being human. And the ideas of science are the most among the most beautiful intellectual discoveries that humanity's ever come up with. It doesn't need anything practical. But in the the idea that that particles can spontaneously pop out of into existence is a very important practical aspect of all quantum mechanics. And in fact, uh, in, in, in certain high fields and in, even in certain temp, uh, transistors and semiconductors, it, it's an integral part of modern technology. So it does have practical applications. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Okay. But it doesn't need to to be interesting. Excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, Capital Gambit, and this is from Twitter. What is more conceptually problematic? I'll take this to you, Charles. Nothing or infinity? They're actually quite related. Uh, that infinity and nothing are almost two, uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, that oh, so they have equal challenges to grasp. That's right, that's right. Uh, if you think about Except he has nothing in his bank account, and if he had an infinite amount of money, he wouldn't be complaining. But, but the money would be worthless. Uh, mm -hmm. So... <laughs> 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 A, ma a mathematical definition of the infinite is a set of stuff which you can take away from, and it's still the same size. And if you think about nothingness, you take away from it, and it's still the same. So there's a lot of properties in common with nothing and infinity. In fact, part of the reason that nothing is so problematic is because when you're staring at nothing, you're looking down the face of infinity. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, oh, wait, wait, I thought if you take away from zero, you get negative numbers. <laughs> That's true. But uh, you just said you take away from zero, you still uh, get zero. 
Uh, well, if you, if you remove zero from the set, you get n the null set. But if you take away from zero, you, go, uh, you get negative numbers, unless you're going in the opposite direction. Right, but uh, you didn't say that a moment ago. I'm just calling you out on that. Yeah, you're right. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, right here, first question up. Yeah. Uh, I have to ask this because I, I'm a biologist, which means essentially an experimentalist. Is there any evidence of nothing? There, there's there's evidence. Wait, wait, Ava, Eva, go. Okay. Okay. So there, there's evidence of this inflationary theory that we keep talking about. The cosmic microwave background has certain um, has a certain uh, structure in it in its fluctuations. So the so-called acoustic peaks in the power spectrum come about um, because of the initial conditions that inflation gives us. But there's there's much. But as a closer as a biologist, you wouldn't be here. It, it turns out that the empty space that you may have learned in high school that protons, are, if you're a good high school, uh, protons are made of three quarks. We lied. Uh, they are made of three quarks, but in fact the quarks account for very little mass of the proton. Most of the mass of the proton comes from the fluctuations in empty space, in the nothingness of the proton. We can actually calculate it. And, and we get, in fact, that a Nobel Prize was re given recently for the theory that allows us to calculate that. So we know that, the, that these weird things are happening in empty space. And, and this there's nothing that isn't a, isn't a vacuum, isn't empty space. Is there any evidence of that? The, oh, this, uh, of course there's vacuum, but is there, is there nothing? You mean no, no space? Yeah. There's no experimental evidence of that. No, no. absolutely, no. because we happen to live in space. So if you put the experiment in the place where there's nothing, then the nothing is no longer nothing. It's got your experiment in <laughs> yeah. to measure the nothing. So, and so then you can't ever measure nothing. It's well, that, not that's there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's the point. That's why it's not so surprising that, we, that there's something, because we couldn't ask the question if there was nothing. Uh, all right. Uh, I, we'll get to this in a minute. Here, next one over here. Oh, I'm a physicist and not a theologian, but since you guys and uh, the, the lady uh, <clears throat> began uh, with a philosophical and theological uh, would anyone care to comment on at least my understanding of the Hebrew Bible, which begins Bereshit, which is the indefinite article in a beginning, not the beginning, as it's translated into English? Anybody have any comments on that philosophy? Uh, you started this, so let's go back over to you. So the question is, I, I don't read Hebrew, so I just trust what he says, that in the Hebrew Bible, it doesn't say, in, it, apparently it says in, the in, in a beginning rather than the beginning. Bereshit, if you, not Bereshit. Well, I, I, I don't speak Hebrew myself, but in, in my studies, I've, I've looked at uh, commentary, and again, you're, you're absolutely correct that some versions, and I didn't know that the Hebrew version said this as well, but it is an indefinite as to whether there was a prior beginning. That, in fact, it's much more explicit in the Greek uh, version that, in fact, uh, there might have been a prior existence, and it had collapsed and there was a void. So, I mean, that's consistent. But that's one of the reasons why it's so ridiculous yeah. to talk about theology when you're trying to explain the universe, because, you know, God speak Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic or, or uh, Arabic. I mean, it's ridiculous. Spoke it's, English. It doesn't explain anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they didn't even know the earth orbited the sun, so why are we listening to them? <laughs> uh, next, right here. Um, my, my definition, uh, my very basic definition of the universe was always everything. So the idea of a multiverse, and you're saying during a quantum fluctuation, a new universe is born. Why is that a new universe and not something that's part of the pre-existing universe? And that's well, what, what, Rich, why don't you take that, Rich? The multiverse is everything. Well, the reason we use so the just word... Just to clarify the question, he's saying if the universe is everything, why distinguish our universe from others that pop up in such a thing as the multiverse? Why even make that distinction? Yeah. It's all the universe. Go. Well, we use the word multiverse because these are expanding so fast that, as I said, event horizons arise between them. If you're in one of these funnels, you, light from the other funnel can never get to you. So we can never observe those uh, other universes. So that's why we, that's why we use that, uh, that's why we use that word. So a universe is not everything, it's everything that you can interact with. Or could have ever. The, cha the now de new definition of the universe is everything you could have once interacted with or you can ever interact with. So everything you can have physical contact with, either in the past or the future, is a universe. And everything that you can't have is not part of our universe. That's our modern definition. Modern? How, how modern is that? It's a good but, question. 
but they all uh, probably since we just bought a multiverse. But these <laughs> other universes are, are are connected to us through the through the trunk of the tree. If you imagine, we're it's, it's a tree with many many branches. We're on this branch over here. We can't see what happened on these other branches, but we've uh, all of us have come from one trunk. Which is the original inflating? Uh, state. But that's in that so, version. There could be other versions, like string uh, theory, where there are there literally could, universes that were never in causal contact. Sure. Okay. I, if that can happen one place, it could happen another. Next, place. right it could here, sir. Even more than once. Number one, thank you all for really making it uh, our minds expand with these things. But or you, implode. Im or implode. <laughs> Either way, it's action of the brain, yeah. which is good. Do you ever feel that as long as we're locked within the confines of our human consciousness? that we're just fish trying to understand the land. And you up there remind me of flying fish that get a better view for a little longer than most. But are we really futilely listening to something about the big bang in the universe that may never really get there at all? What he's saying is, do we, how stupid do we think we are? Well, look. That's the question. No, but oh, wait, 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 Jim, it's Jim. a really profound question. No, no, I got question. Jim, Jim, okay. pick that up. <laughs> well, uh, okay. The, did, did, I, did I characterize your question accurately? So, uh, yeah. You did. I okay. mean, the thing is, oh, it reminds me of a car without positive traction with only one wheel spinning in the snow. Are we ever going we to get all that four movie. wheels and drive? Movie. Yes. Okay, go. Uh, State-of-the-art physics does not give us any uh, satisfying picture of how the world is. According to state-of-the-art physics, there's this one thing called, you know, a system, call it U for the universe, and it has a, a very complicated state, which is a point in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, and the state that it's in is determined by uh, Hamiltonian, and this is what reality is. It's not tables and chairs and boxes. When I see a bowl of cherries on the table, all I see is that, that this... Uh, uh, that the system U is in a certain region of the Hilbert space. That is the picture that, that physics gives us of reality. It's a terrible picture. I mean, quantum mechanics makes no sense. You're agreeing that we're picture. all too stupid. And, and people say, you know, just shut up and calculate. It works beautifully. So it's, it's, it's empirically adequate. It explains all the observational evidence, but it doesn't give us a satisfying picture of reality. So I think we're, you know, we're utterly, we're, we talk very cavalierly about why there's something rather than nothing. We have the feeblest grasp of what, what something is and what existence is. But you know, it's worse than that. It's empirically. Well, wait, that, no. <laughs> if it's worse than that, I don't need to know about it. Okay? No, empirically, we're limited by the fact that we happen to evolve in a, at 14 billion years or roughly into the history of the universe. There are questions we will never be able to answer because of the accident of our birth. And, and, and what's amazing is we're, we're coming pretty close to some of them, and that's fast, amazing. But we didn't have to, we, 20 years ago, we weren't even, 30 years ago, we weren't even thinking some of these questions. Wait, so, wait. Uh, you know, we're forever limited in our knowledge, and that's just life. Lawrence, you're suggesting we're f limited in our knowledge because we're born at one time and not another time, rather than just that we're too stupid. Well, it's a combination. We also okay. may have limits in our so brains. I want you to, get, to admit that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, yes. I was going to admit it for you, but I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. I simply want to follow up on the question that I asked earlier. Multi-universes, you're sim simply um, kicking the can down the road. Because at the end of that, you're going to ask it, nothing, and then there is another aspect of it because th theological. Do you follow me? No, uh, I, don't well, I didn't follow it, did you? Uh, uh, let, me, let me reflect on it for a moment, okay? Uh, I've thought about this recently. Uh, the universe we have come to learn with hard-earned science research, the universe doesn't make anything in ones, okay? We imagine that Earth was sort of unique among objects, and we found it was just one of a bunch of planets in orbit around a star that was pretty special to us, and then we learned it's just one of 100 billion stars in our galaxy, well, the galaxy was special up until 1920. Then we had this debate about whether the galaxy is all there is, or there's something else outside of it. We learned there are island galaxies out there billions of them, and so then we have this universe. Ah, that's the one universe in which we're all contained. So maybe the universe doesn't even come in ones. And if that's the case, the, the multiverse picks this up, and then you have multiple universes. But that leaves me to ask the question, which we will not answer today, if nothing ever comes in ones, not even a universe, then would that possibly mean that the multiverse doesn't even come in ones. Yeah, sure, sure. I don't know. Uh, it's just. Sure. 
the, that he said we're still kicking the can down the road, and I bet <laughs> you Jim Holt would agree. There is nothing or the other alternative is theological. It's God. Well, there can be alternatives that are not always religious. That's an interesting false dichotomy that's often set up. If it's not this, it must be religious. No, if it's not this, it could be other stuff you haven't thought of yet. You, you can't assert an answer just because it's not something else. And that's a, it's a false argument that's been made throughout time. And the better scientists, as they move forward, never assume anything just because one thing is wrong. Okay, uh, right here, sir. We'll go another five minutes and we'll call it a night. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Uh, good evening. Good um, evening. I, uh, you guys mentioned quantum tunneling earlier, right? Which is, Isn't uh, that cool, quantum tunneling? Oh my God. I would so want a quantum tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really glad that you're, you're, you're excited to talk about this. So um, you, you mentioned you can pretty much like go through a mountain without going up or around it, and a mountain being something. Um, I read a couple, uh, a couple of years ago that scientists have, were able to teleport electrons through a vacuum, like a distance of like nominal distance, like nine meters or something like that, um, through a vacuum, which is you know, pretty much nothing. It's the same thing that space is made out of. Um, so is there, is there really any, anything that's holding us back from with, with uh, quantum tunneling and, and teleportation through vacuums, s stopping us from taking things that are actual tangible objects and being able to teleport them? Hmm. Is, is that, something, okay, that, so, is that so, something that's achievable okay, within I think like, we got to go to Lawrence on this because he wrote a book called The Physics of Star Trek. Yeah, true. <laughs> okay, <all about. laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say, yes. Um, so the answer, I, 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 the answer is that, that um, it was really good public relations for people to call it quantum teleportation. And the answer is we can do strange things with electrons and photons specifically because we can prepare them in very special quantum mechanical states. So we can do remarkable things with photons and electrons because we can prepare them in a very special quantum mechanical state and create these things called quantum correlations, which you don't need to go into, that allow you to do strange, miraculous, and crazy things. At a distance. But, but yes, but we, but, the, but, but we are not specially prepared quantum mechanical states. Yeah. And therefore, we, w we can teleport quantum mechanical states but you and I have to take airplanes. <laughs> okay. 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 I wish it wasn't the case. Sir, right here. Go. Um, I noticed throughout the talk that nobody seemed to strongly object to the idea of the degenerate state. Um, some people thought it might be a futile uh, abstraction, and some thought it might be you know, the possible point zero of you know our creation. At the same time, I noticed that. Um, the real arguments b seem to be over the existence of spontaneity. Does anyone here have an aesthetic difficulty with absolute spontaneity? Not spontaneity that just seems that way beyond our understanding of the universe. Uh, Jim? Absolute spontaneity sounds like something happening according to no law or no rule. Is that what you had in mind? Yes, not dictated by external factors. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, there, it's, it's very problematic in what sense laws dictate events to begin with. I mean, if, if laws, you know, we, we, uh, this is my complaint about, about Larry, is that he sees laws as though they're divine commands. Who's and that Larry? They, he doesn't like being called Larry. Call, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, there's so some professor, needling going professor on here. Professor Krauss. Um, <laughs> Lawrence. The, um, I, you know, the laws somehow reach out to events from outside space-time and control the way events occur. They cause events to occur in a certain way, and that means, of course, if laws are causing events to occur, you need another set of laws to explain how the first set of laws cause events to occur. So it gets very messy. And laws are sort of like, you know, either they're, they're like platonic, timeless entities that float above the space-time world, or they're like divine commands that exact obedience and, and, and prevent things from being spontaneous. Um, I think that laws are simply high-level summaries of, of the patterns in the world, and that's why I don't see how you can appeal to laws to explain the existence of the world, to explain why there's something rather than nothing, because laws in here within a world, they, they don't have any uh, power to exact obedience from the world. The, the, the laws of Newtonian physics uh, are a summary of irregularities such as the planets uh, rotating around the sun. They don't 
force the planets to rotate, to revolve around the sun in certain orbits. But I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I feel I'm evading your question about absolute spontaneity. Is, is there a world in which there were no patterns and no regularities at all? Is that con conceptually possible? I think not, because you, there, there are results in the uh, mathematics of combinatorics which say that there are always going to be some regularities. You ha can't have a completely random world. So. Yeah, I don't think you could have complete spontaneity, but that sounds like uh, I'm uh, talking through my hat. No. <laughs> That's why I picked on no. you. Yeah, uh, next question here. We'll just take these last set of questions and we're done. we'll call it a night. Thank you, sir. Yes. All right, so there is a theory that the universe runs on a cycle in which it ends and then, you know, everything shrink shrinks back down to a really small size and the Big Bang happens again. Um, the Big Bang is a reaction to something um, and something has to trigger that reaction. And so, does that mean that um, absolute nothingness can never, you know, exist? There always has been something? So that's the, uh, can I? Yeah, that? Eva. I mean, that's a, an interesting thing that should have been brought up. There's certainly a logical possibility of maybe an oscillating universe that never quite goes away. Um, it's, it always was, if it's oscillating. If, if so, I mean, there, and there are models of this which work up to a certain point but it's challenging. I mean, it requires a certain source of stress energy to obtain the, the, the sort of crunch bang that you're asking for repeatedly. And I don't know of a realistic model of that, but it's, it's a perfectly good question to ask. Thank you. Yeah, it's not Your a good, question not got complimented and we have no answer for you. They're That's models, what it sounded like. <laughs> okay. They're models, but not good models. Yeah. Typically when a scientist says good question, it means they don't know the answer, right? <laughs> That's how that works. Uh, Lad, we'll go through these real quickly, sir. So uh, this evening seems to have been focused on defining nothing, um, definitions of nothing. And, but when it came to sort of the relevance of nothing, uh, we're, it was sort of quick to dismiss the question of why in favor of the question of how. And I guess to, to me it seems that the, the question of how is at least directionally simpler than the question of why insofar as we may not exactly know the, the, the answer to how, but we keep getting closer as science advances us uh, and we, we really can sort of infer a first cause at least. Um, is because, there a question? Yeah, yeah, coming? because okay. yeah, I, mean, I think the point is how is a process and, and, and if you go from the very first something and just go one step back to nothing, you no longer have the device of saying this caused this and this caused this and this caused this because by definition there was nothing to cause something. So I guess my question is, you know, is, is the relevance, is our fascination with nothing in, in your views um, really coming back to the question of why? Why does this all exist? L Which look, was, look. Okay. So all, wait, just, just so Lawrence's book begins with the word why. Tell me the title of your book. The, actually, the first, the title is A Universe from Nothing. The subtitle is Why is There Something Rather Than Nothing. The subtitle begins? Why? Okay, and, then, and then the preface, I explain why that's a bad question. Okay, and, but and let, me, let me ask you. But, 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 let but me, isn't it true that we had an argument about the difference between how and why, and you were, you were discarding the why? Well, I don't think why has any meaning. Why assumes purpose. If you really mean, why always means how, unless you assume there's some intentionality. That's the assumption of why, and what, then you're assuming the answer before you ask the question. So why, there, why may not just be a good question. There may no. be no intentionality. There may, may be no reason for why the universe exists. It may, there's a, a process of how it exists. And then the first cause, if time doesn't exist before the Big Bang, what do you mean by cause? What do you mean by before? Those questions, which have been so vital to the way people think, may just be bad questions. Now, the question of why does not Asking the question why does not presume intentionality. I'll give you an example. Why, uh, suppose we have the final theory, which everyone thinks is just over the horizon. Once we have that, as Steven Weinberg will tell you, or any reflective person will tell you, there still leaves open the question why that theory. Well, one answer to that might be that it's the only logically consistent theory. Uh, so that's the probably really not true because the theory, theory of nothing is logically consistent. But and so, in a further answer, and this was sort of you know toyed with by John Archibald Wheeler. Who, who coined the term uh, a black hole, among many other achievements, was Richard Feynman's teacher. He said that the laws of physics might be the only logically consistent set that uh, permit the emergence of conscious observers. 
That would but be I would another say that's a how interesting question. why, once I you've answered the how question, how the laws of physics ordained a universe you know, coming out of a patch of false vacuum, then you could further ask the why question about why the laws have this general form. And I think that that's, that's a, not to be discarded lightly. I that's would an say interesting that's a question 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 for how you as well. did the, the laws of See physics what you started arrive here? the form they do? <laughs> what? Uh, we got to move on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But, yes. Descartes' theory of I think, therefore I am kind of gives this idea of existence being something that we have to qualify, that we have to qualify existence using some sort of description. And sort of, you were talking about how reaching behind your head in that space that we can't really see and can't really describe kind of gives a description to nothingness, but nothingness can't really be described. So how can we talk about nothingness when we can't really describe it? Your professor where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like that question. Um, well, well, that's why I use the example because you you can't really describe <laughs> what it what what it looks like back there. So, so, so <laughs> Professor you know, Gott's metaphor uh, reference to nothing is the best answer to your question because he didn't even describe it; he just gestured to it. <laughs> that no, but look, physicists. The whole point of science is we actually say this we can describe and we can discuss it. And it may not be what you mean by nothing, but it's the, you know, so these are the, we try and well, make things well defined and inevitably they're mathematically well defined. And, and that's the best we can do. And we can't do any better. <laughs> you know, and, and it may not satisfy you, but that's it. Scientists so, so <laughs> try, so try to answer the how question just because that's what the science can answer. But uh, you're and, leaving it yeah. a brute fact why the, the laws of physics take the form they do. And I, I, and I think that you know, the, the principle of sufficient reason always look for an explanation for any truth, try to find an explanation of why it's true for anything that exists, try to find an explanation for its existence. This is a, a great principle that's always driven inquiry and it's been the, you know, the, the motor of science. And I think to discard it once you arrive at the final theory is a certain, you know, it's, it's intellectual but philistinism, it's, it's cowardice, it's laziness. No, but I think it's just semantics. See what you started? Say, it's okay. how. <laughs> yeah, anyway. And you're all of those things, and a slut. The last, <laughs> <laughs> the last well, we question of the sir, you better yeah, stop, I, ask other, I shut I them up somehow. I just want to thank you uh, for being here. I was um, on my way to Acme Auto Parts and somebody pulled me into the, <laughs> and I, I don't have the foggiest idea, but um, I just wanted to say in the, uh, my thought was that in a, the multidimensional universe or the string theory idea, I wonder how many of these forums are going on out there in the, in the universe right now, <laughs> talking about the same things. The other thing is, if, we, if, this, is being, if this is being recorded right now, I, I think what, at least what, what, what this panel and what this process shows is the passion with which we, we look at these things in science and trying to find the answers of how and why. And that's at least, because if we, if we uh, uh, record this and in 25 years we all come back and your son is, 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 is the, uh, the moderator tonight and we look at everybody up here and, and what they've said, that, uh, I wonder what they're going to be saying about, yeah, they were on target, you know? Um, I doubt it, really. I yeah. hope we're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really Something hope tells we're all wrong. Me. The other thing about Descartes, what I really understood was, and I, and I have right, reason to understand that I'm pretty accurate in this, is that, because I was over in Paris for a while back, is that Sorry. his thing of, of je pense donc je suis, or I think therefore I am, was not the end of it. it no, what, we really don't, what we really don't know is, I think therefore I am a something, and that was left out, so we don't really know what was after that. So. Well, I certainly hope we're all wrong. I hope 25 years from now we have, we've learned a lot more. And that's yeah. because we do science. And right, so I wrong. think what I'm saying is that we don't really have the answers tonight. We have the best answers that we have at this point in time. Excellent point to end this one. Thank you all. I'd like to, just before we, have a good just before we break, I just want to uh, publicly thank uh, some people who helped run this event. My executive assistant, Elizabeth Stachow, who runs my life. <laughs> uh, Laura Venner is our stage manager. Suzanne Morris runs the Hayden programs. And uh, Dominic Davis is also active in making all this work. And, uh, and a, a bevy of volunteers. I want to thank them publicly. And give us one last round of applause for the panel. We'll see you next year or back at the tables where we have the book signing.
You all drive safely. Thanks for coming.